Okay, I just want to finish one last point here very quickly. So right at the end of Parshas Baloscha, the very last page. And the Torah says on page 796, It actually starts on the bottom in 794. So we were talking about the section where Miriam and Aaron speak about Moshe Rabbeinu. And uh, after they finished speaking about Moshe Rabbeinu, so then you see it five, six lines from the bottom. It says, Vayomer Hashem pisom el Moshe ve'el Aaron ve'el Miriam. Hashem says suddenly to Moshe, Aaron, and Miriam, Tzu'u shloshtachem elo amoid, vayetzu shloshtam. The three of them go out. Vayered Hashem ba'avuda anan vayemet pesach ha'oel vayikra Aaron and Miriam vayetzu shteim. Aaron and Miriam come out. Hashem summons them. Two lines from the bottom. Vayomer shimon advarai. Now listen to me. Imiyani v'yachem Hashem emarei lo v'zvada v'chalama davrabo. Normally a prophet, I communicate in a, I communicate in a dream, meaning it's this type of vision. It's a, it's a somewhat ambiguous vision. Moshe is not the same as the other prophets. He has it at a different level, a higher level of prophecy. Pel, pel, daber boy, speak to him mouth to mouth. bechidos in a clear picture without any sort of uh, a, a distorted image. He sees the vision of God. How dare, how could you not be afraid to speak against my servant Moshe? Then it says, Hashem Hashem gets angry and he leaves. And the next thing you know, Miriam has leprosy. So one of the Mephorshim points out over here that this is a life lesson in how you ever tell somebody off. First of all, somebody once said, if you feel can you can you move this plate up, 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 up the plate away the uh, no, get, get it all the way down? I can't take that small. Thanks. The uh, it also doesn't look good on the camera. The, uh, the people will see what the issue of a food is. The uh, um, the uh, 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 there's a rule in life. Sometimes a person says, "Yeah, boy, I really feel like telling him off. I really feel like telling him off." You know, you got to tell somebody off. That's when you don't. You don't tell somebody off when you feel like telling them off. If you tell somebody off when you feel like telling them off, the result is going to be an argument and a conflict, and the guy's going to get defensive. The first thing you see at Kodesh Baruch Hu first tells them what they need to hear. Only after that does it say that Hashem gets angry. When Farshim point out, don't get angry and then say it. First say it, then you can get angry. But first say what you have to say. If you're going to tell somebody off, you have to know where it's coming from. If it's for the per- for the good of the cause, there's no reason to get angry. And if you're angry, that means you're probably personally involved, and people sense that on us. And when you're personally involved, then you're angry because you're personally involved. People are, 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 are more resistant to accepting it. Whereas if there's actually a, 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 an objective reason, now listen, i got to correct you. You're doing something wrong objectively. Why, what are you getting upset about? Why, why are you upset? And therefore, sometimes you don't, when you feel like, you know, and this happens more than any, any other time. It happens in families. It happens certainly when you're raising kids. And not only children, but not only children, but you're raising teenagers who are an undefined species. Uh, and and, and they, can, they can really get under your skin. And they're very sensitive. And as soon as you get, as soon as teenagers sense that parent, I mean, you guys were once teenagers, as soon as teenagers sense that the parents are getting upset, then they turn you off. They just turn you off. They don't even hear you. Right? They, just, they just ignore you and they go on. So, so it has to be that they see that there's a genuine concern, not, a, not an excuse to let loose on them. That's the first thing, that's the first thing we learn over here. Okay? The last point is... Um, the last point is, one second, one more point. Then I, I want to get on to. I want to get on to Vayishlach. Yeah, uh, just Moshe Rabbeinu says a prayer, and if you look at page, uh, if, if you look six lines from the bo- uh, six lines from the bottom. Vayitzak Moshe el Hashem lemor. Moshe cries out to Hashem and he says, Kel na refon Allah. Five words of prayer. It's the shortest tefillah we find ever. And I once noticed, not only it's a short tefillah, 
each word in the tefillah is the shortest possible word that could have been used. There, each word is two letters, except for rifa, which is three letters. So it's five words, eleven uh, five words, eleven letters. Kel na rifa na pasuk yud gimel. Kel na rifa na la. So Moshe Rabbeinu didn't want to stand in daven. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't want to stand in daven long because then people will say, oh sure, it's his sister. That's why he's davening for so long. You know, because his sister there's a little bit of nepotism here. So Moshe Rabbeinu is going to go say a longer shmon right now and go give a whole. So Moshe Rabbeinu says the shortest tefillah possible. Kel na rifa na la. That's it. That's the whole tefillah, and that is going to be. Uh, the the Akash uh, Baruch uh, accepts Moshe Rabbeinu's tefillah, but Miriam, uh, everybody has to wait for Miriam while Miriam is 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 left outside the camp because she has to be cured from her leprosy. And here we find that Miriam is paid back for what she once did when she waited. Who did she wait for? She waited for Moshe Rabbeinu. When Moshe Rabbeinu was thrown into the water, he was in the basket, and she stood there to see what's going to happen. And therefore she gets paid back that the entire Jewish people waited for her. And we see from here that HaKadosh Baruch Hu pays for good things, he pays out of proportion. Mida tova maruba mibidas puranos. That means that when a person is rewarded, we are rewarded out of proportion of what we've done. That's how HaKadosh Baruch Hu works. Mida tova maruba mibidas puranos. Baruch Hu pays you back, and he pays you back tenfold and even more for something good that you've done. She waited for one person, she waited for Moshe Rabbeinu, the entire Jewish people now wait for her. That's what the, that's what the Torah is teaching us. Okay, now we go on to Parsha Shlach. Page 798. The Torah says, Vaydabra Hashem Shlach lecha anoshim, send men, v'yasuru es eretz kenan, let them, now how does the arts go translate? Let them spy out. We're going to have to get to this word v'yasuru. Spy out the land of Kenan, Asher Ani no Yisro, which I am giving to the Jewish people. Ish echad, ish echad, the mate avos of Tishlachu, one man per tribe. Kol nasi vahem, the heads, the leaders of the tribes. You're going to send them to spy out the land of Israel. Now, first of all, you know, I'm sure you know the end of the story. The end of the story is that it's not going to work out so well. Uh, they're going to bring back a negative report, and so on and so forth. So before anything, we have to figure out what, what went wrong over here. What, what, which I'm just jumping ahead just so we get the end of the story before we get, but this is really the, the, the underlying theme of the story. What, 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 what went wrong over here? First of all, why are you checking it out? I said you should go into the land of Israel. Hashem said you should go in. And that's why he says, Shlach Lecha. And Moshe Rabbeinu, you don't need to do this, but if you want to do it, you could go ahead and do it. And then it backfires. Now, what went wrong over here, and why are they spying? They were sent to spy out the land. So they go into the land, and they come back and say, well, the people are strong, and the cities are fortified, and we're not going to be able to go in. It's going to be too hard. And so what, where did they, where was the flaw? I'm just, just giving you a, a, brief, a brief overview. The basic flaw is, the basic flaw here is that there's a difference between sending you for what and sending you for if. So if a general sends a guy, uh, 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 the commanding officer sends a guy to spy out the enemy's, the enemy's position, tell me what their position is. Okay, they're, they're entrenched over here, and they got this amount of tanks, and this amount of this, this amount of that. Thank you. That, I want the information. Then the guy comes back, so he says, okay, this is the amount of tanks, this is the amount of their position. I don't think we can, I don't think we're, we, can, we can take, the, take this hill. I didn't ask you for your opinion. I, that wasn't my, I wasn't sending you for your opinion. I was sending you for information. I'll make the decisions. I didn't send you for your opinion. You were sent into the land. These spies are sent into the land in order to go and find out. Bring me back the information. I'll decide how, if, and when. And they come back and say, no, no, we're not going to be able to do it. That's where they cross the line. That's just the, the overview of the story. Even more than that, if you look at the word vayasuru, Right? The word Vayasuru es Eretz Kenan. Later on, how are they referred to? Um, in Pasuk 20, uh, where is it? Where does the Torah refer to? They're called, oh, 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 in, 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 in Sefer Dvarim. What are these men referred to? How do you say spies in Hebrew? Miraglin. They're called the Miraglin. What's the difference? It's why, according to that, the Torah should say, Shlach lecha anoshim v'yiraglu esa'aretz. They should spy out the land because they're called Miraglin. That would be the verb form of Miraglin. 
What is vayasuru? Vayasuru esar. The, the word vayasuru comes from the Hebrew word yitaron. You know what a yitaron is? Yitaron means an advantage. Something good. Send them into the land so they should bring back a report. The, bring, that positive, bring back a positive report. I didn't ask you to bring back your opinion of what's negative. A person who's a miragel, miragel means you're looking for the negative. So the entire story hinges on what the job is and what they did. Your job was to go into the land and try to bring back a positive report because we know it's a good land. Because God said it's a good land and we're meant to go into this land. So why did you bring back the negative report? That's the, that's the underlying theme here. Now, you'll notice that the land is called the land of Canaan. Where are we, gentlemen? What do we call it? Eretz Yisrael. We call it, but the original name of the land was the land of Canaan. Because right? the Canaanites lived there. Now, what is the word, the land, every, every land has a, has a what do you call it, every, every country has a name. And in Lashon HaKodesh, you know that every name has a certain meaning. There are no names that don't have a meaning. I told you once, like, for example, the name Avraham, right? He's the father of the nations, right? Uh, Moshe means he drew, he drew out, he was drawn out of the water. He will draw the Jewish people out. Every name has a meaning. I told you, David means, everybody remember what David means? Beloved. The beloved one, right? The beloved one. Thank you very much. David means the beloved one. So every name has a, every name has a specific meaning. Here... It's called the land of Canaan. Canaan kind of is related to the Hebrew word hachna'a, which is submission. It's the land of submission. It's a land where people submit. In the ancient world, what they submitted to was idol worship. That's why the land of Canaan was the seat of idol worship in the ancient world, whereas the land of Egypt was the land of immorality. So the land which will lend itself to submission is Eretz Canaan. So that's why when Jews come to Israel, that's why you find this phenomenon of Jews who may have been not connected to, to Judaism, then they come to Israel and something happens. That they just get that, that they, something happens when they come to Israel. We had a guy here once who told me he was, on a, he was on a world tour. He was traveling the world wherever he was he's going and he happened to be on the hills of Jordan. He had no plans to come to Israel. He happened to be on the hills in Jordan and he was standing on the Jordanian hills looking into, looking into Israel and said, hey, that's the land that Moses was not able to go into. Right? And I'm right here. Well, I'm, you know, holy Moses. You know, I'd like to go in. And so he came here and never left. Right? Today he's involved. He runs an outreach organization in, in Chutzlar. So he came into the land. But what happened to you? You come into Israel, next thing you know, you see, you feel a certain, there's a different feeling being in Israel than being in Kansas City. Right? It's just different. You feel there's a certain hachna, there's a certain submission. If you go to the old city, go to the old city, and in, a, in the radius of about a square mile, in the old city, you've got basically every religion in the world represented there, right? And about the way you got, you got Greek Orthodox and Armenians and Muslims and this and that, that, that just about everything. And, and one square, one square mile, you got you got the whole thing. Why? Because it's a land of hachna. It's a land that lends itself to submission. And therefore, the mission over here is Moshe made to come back and bring us the report. We're going in anyway. It's not I'm asking you if we should or shouldn't. We're go, we're meant to be going in. Okay. So he sends, and the Torah then goes through. The names of the people, right? Now, I just want to show you what, what's in a name, just to show you the, the, how Torah could be understood at so many different levels. So if you take a look in, uh, uh, what do you call it? It says, Ve'elish uh, Mosam, um, a fifth line. Ve'elish these are their names. Lemate Reuven, from the tribe of Reuven, Shabua ben Zakur. His name is Shabua ben Zakur. Now, uh, what is the word Shamua ben Zakur? Shamua ben Zakur, that's the name of a man. Uh, what's in a name? What, what could the Torah possibly be alluding to in Shamua ben Zakur? Listen and remember. Listen and remember. Isn't that interesting? Listen and remember. What's that got to do? Okay, so I, it, taking it completely out of context, completely out of context, one of context is this alludes to a different idea. The Talmud itself says, when you study Torah, unlike other, other, unlike other disciplines, when you study, uh, let's say you're studying for a biology test, or you're studying for a physics test, you're studying for any test. And so when we studied, how did you study? Right? How did you study for a test? You read the material, right? Yeah. I don't think anybody studies for an engineering test. I don't think anybody, right? No, nobody, nobody studies for a chemistry test. You go into a library where it's as quiet as could possibly be, and you, and you, and you study. 
or you figure out who you're going to sit next to on the test, whatever, how, whatever your means of studying is. But at the end of the day, nobody's sitting there chanting it out loud. You walk into a base medrash where people are learning to work first, so it looks like people are ready to, to slug it out. Right? People are ready, uh, yeah, somebody's going, all right, what are you talking about? That's called Milcham Tashel, the battle of Torah. And it should never become personal, by the way, even if, he, even if people resort to name-calling. You nincompoop, can't you think straight? You know, but we love each other. Right? The Gemara itself says that you can have the Rebbe and a Talmud, the rabbi and his disciple, you can have a father and his son sitting and studying Gemara. And over, they become bitter enemies over the Gemara, but they walk away, they love each other. But over the Gemara, all's fair, all's fair in love and Gemara. Right? You know, you know, we're, we're what do you call it? Yeah. Right. right now we're trying to work this out. Right? Yeah. You know, that, that, what are you talking? Can't you read? <laughs> you know, and you get that's one form of study. What if you're studying by yourself? So the Gemara itself says if you want to facilitate your memory, you study out loud. You have to say the words out loud. You can't read it with your eyes. You can't learn Gemara with your eyes. You have to you don't have to, by the way, you don't have to shake back and forth. You know, the, 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 you, we naturally do that. Don't ask me why. It's based on a Pusik, by the way. Based on, yeah, there's a Pusik that says, Kol tomarna. All of my limbs, all my bones will praise you, God. That's why when you get in davening, that's why people tend to shake, tend to shuckle during davening. Right? Then they go to physical therapy if they overdo it. But yeah, it doesn't have, it doesn't have to be a what do you call it? It just you know just a a, a basic you know you know the kind of people tend tend to sway. When you're learning, you have to learn out loud. Shamua, if you hear the words that you yourself are saying, ben zakur, then you're going to remember it better. That's what it comes to. That, that, that's absolutely completely out of context of the spice. It's just what the Torah itself is included. Remember, Torah can be learned in seventy. There's tremendous depth, tremendous what do you call it when it comes to Torah. Number one. Number two, Lemate Shimon Shafat ben Chori. Shafat ben Chori. Does anybody have any idea what that could allude to? That's his name, Shafat ben Chori. Does anybody have any idea what those two words could connect up to? Shafat ben Chori. What do you say? Judge of learning. Ooh, good. Shafat is like a shofate. It sounds like a judge. And Chori, do you ever hear the idea? There's something called a Ben Chorin. Yeah. What's a Ben Chorin? A free person. Somebody who's a Ben Chorin. Ben Chorin Elamisha Osek So I want to show you something incredible. Just, 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 uh, just remarkable. We have in um, a judge. In order to be a judge, you have to be unbiased. A judge who's biased is disqualified. So, in, in monetary law, for example, the halacha is a judge is not allowed to be intimidated. You're not allowed to be intimidated. If you are qualified to be a judge and you're already started, you're, you're judging a case, you can't be intimidated by anyone. Number one, you have to be free of any external influences, which is one of the reasons that a judge has to, even in halacha, a judge has to recuse himself from a case if he feels that he does have a bias. So you have examples in the Gemara where Shmuel, the great town of Shmuel, was walking and somebody came over and pulled a feather off of him. He said, why'd you do that? The guy said, well, I actually have a call. I'll see, in, I'll see you in court today. I'll see you in court later today. And Shmuel took himself off the case. He said, I can't. I'm biased. You did me a favor. I'm, I can no longer judge you. A judge has to know when there are external factors that are affecting him. Shafat, if you want to be a judge, Ben Chori, you have to be free of external factors. You know where that you know where that comes into play? Every one of us is a judge. There's a word, one of my least favorite words in the English language is being judgmental. You're being very judgmental. Right? Well, you're being very judgmental about my judgmentalness. Right? So who's being judgmental here? Why did you you decide I'm judgmental? Well, you're judging also right now, aren't you? Right? And I got news for you. Right? True or not true, Jay? Right? You're being judgmental. That means when you say judgmental, it means you disagree with my opinion. That's what you mean. Oh, you're being very judgmental. Now, being judgmental means that you don't agree with me. Therefore, you've decided I'm judgmental. If you would agree with me, you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't say I'm judgmental. So anytime I express a criticism of anybody, you say, oh, you're being very judgmental. Well, the guy did shoot up a school, so I think he's a Russia. You're being very judgmental. Uh, I'm being judgmental. I'm be you're mental. I'm, being, I'm, I'm, judge I'm judging accurately. Don't tell me I'm being judgmental. The answer is we make thousands of judgments every day. Thousands, not hundreds, not tens, 
thousands of judgments every day. When you sit down at a plate, when you're eating your food, you have just made a judgment that I'm going to pick at a, I'm going to eat a cucumber now instead of the spaghetti. And each time you shift your hand, you've made a judgment. And when you look at a person, you make judgments, whether you're going to admit it or not make judgments. There are certain people that you will look at and say, wow, that's a nice person. And somebody else, if you ever say, wow, he's good looking, you just made a judgment. And there are other people you look at and say, no matter what happens, I will never lend this person money. Right? On the first glance, I'll just meet you, I'll meet you, hi, how are you, what's your name, but don't worry, I'm never going to lend you money. Right? And we're making judgments like that all day, every day. So a person has to make judgments about behavior. Should I do this or should I not do it? Should I engage in this behavior or should I not? From a halachic point of view, from a moral, ethical point of view, how can you know that you're making the proper judgment? How do you know you're making the proper judgment? Shafat ben Chori. If you have no external biases. I am completely objective. I am Shafat. I am a judge right now. Ben Chori. And I am completely objective. And if I suspect that I'm not objective, then I cannot make that judgment. And we all suffer from that in various places and places of life. I have what I want to do and I have what I think I need, what I should do. And I have to know that I can make an objective judgment. And very often, if I know that I have, a bi I have a bias, you better not make that judgment. You better ask somebody else. You've been offered a job that involves a very high salary and you can make more money. It sounds too good to be true. You know the old saying, right? If it's too good to be true, it probably is. Right? And, but, but it's very, very tempting. It's extremely tempting. And I'm so tempted by it that I've lost my objectivity. You better go get another opinion. Go get another opinion, because you're not being objective over here. Go find out. Go find out from somebody else. I, I want to go into, what do you call, I want to go into the store. I'll get to you one second, Jake. I want to go into the supermarket. They got, a, they got a special sale on, on, they got a special sale limited to two per customer. Well, I'm going to take my two. I'll pay for it, go out to the parking lot, and then come back in and then take another two. They don't mind. I'm sure they don't mind. I'm sure it's okay. I'm sure it's okay. Yeah, you're sure? You're sure? Why don't you just ask? Hey, go into a hotel, go into a Holiday Inn. They don't mind if I take a towel. It's good advertising for them. You know, good advertising. How a Holiday Inn towel hanging in your shower is advertising for them, I'm not quite sure. Right? You know, oh, they don't mind if I take a few soaps. Right? <laughs> they don't mind. It's good. They, they want us to take it. Oh, yeah? Why don't you just ask them? Right? You might be surprised at the answer. So if you're not sure, you're not sure, and are you biased? Boy, are you ever biased. You're extremely biased. So just ask. Just ask. That's, in order to make a judgment, you have to be a Ben-Hori. That's what Torah is like. Are you familiar with the, I'll get to you one second, Jake. Are you familiar with the Mesilla Sisharim? Yeah. Talks about the garden maze. Have you ever heard of the garden maze in the, in the Mesilla Sisharim? Did you ever see the movie The Shining with Jack Nicholson? Yeah. yeah I saw 10 minutes of it. Couldn't take it. I ran out. I think actually 15. I lasted 15 minutes. My brother was 10 minutes. I met him in the lobby. Our third, our third friend stayed the entire time. I couldn't take it. They, he going through this garden maze, right? And I, you know, that, so the Mrs. <laughs> Sharm. Anyway, Jack Wickelson always gave me the creeps. On a good day, he gave me the creeps. Eating ice cream, he gave me the creeps. So on a, on, 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 the, the, there's a garden maze. And you're in one of these garden mazes. You know, if you ever seen these garden mazes, the walls are very high. You can't see where you're going. And you're trying to get through this maze. And there's a guy standing, this is not my example, this is the Mesil Shisharim, the Ramchal, Rabbi Lozato brings this up, Rabbi Moshechad Lozato. There's a guy standing on a platform who has a clear view of the maze. And as you're going through, you have two choices. You could try to do it on your own, in which case you keep going around, you just get, keep getting stuck in this labyrinth. Or... You could ask him which way he's got. He's been through the maze already. Now he's up on the platform watching. He said, no, 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 make a right over there. No, 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 that's a mistake. Don't make that left. Go to another right. Okay, now go straight, assuming you trust the guy. So you're better off obeying him. A person trying to get through life, life is a maze. And sometimes we think this is the move I should make and this is the move I should make. There are people who have been through the maze. There are people who see what works and what doesn't work, especially when it comes to Torah and mitzvahs and Yiddishkeit and growth. They know what feels good is not always the right thing. To the contrary, if it's something you really want to do, it's generally, generally an indication it's not the right thing. Because the Yetzirah, very, very, the evil inclination very rarely gets you excited about mitzvahs. And if you're really excited about doing something, chances are that it isn't what you should be doing. So if a person understands 
that to get through the maze, you have to have somebody with objective W. That's Shafat ben Chori. Okay? Yeah, Jake, go ahead. So you told us in Parshat Bamidbar that the names of all of the people in B'nai Israel had like some significance to their, to their essential essence. So um, when you said that Shafat son of, son of Hori, right, his essential essence, it seems like, is to be a... Uh, clearly objective judge. So how could he have made such a mistake over here? Very good. Excellent question. I don't know what the extent of that is. The, the idea that, that your name is your essence and there, you know, they're, they're, here they're talking about it, using it as a, as a, what do you call it? And it could be that the idea is that you may think, the Torah teaches you, you may think that you're fully objective and you're not. Which begs the question, why did they bring back a negative report? This also is just, a, just a, we're, we're jumping the gun a little bit. That based on the, on, on, based on the, on the Zohar, it said, you know why they brought back a negative report? Because they were the leaders of the people. They were leaders. And they knew that when they go into the land of Israel, there's going to be, they're going to they're re reshuffle the deck. And they were concerned they're going to lose their position of leadership. How do you like that? And therefore, they came up with a reason not to go into the land of Israel. Talk about people at a very high level. We see that in Israeli politics. Right? See, Israeli politics, that everybody's afraid that the, if the government dissolves, you know, they always talk about the joke that people, members of the Knesset, have glue on their seat of their pants. Because once they're sitting in that seat, they're not giving it up so, not giving it up so easily. Because who knows what's going to be in the next election if you're, are you going to get in and you're not going to get in, and it happens to be a very good job. Next time around, I'm a member of the Knesset. It's a very good job. Good salary, great benefits, don't have to work too hard. Right? It's a great job. My wife says I'll be lonely. It's just, she's just not willing to marry a politician. Right? But, uh, so I'll have to think about that. You know, so, but, you know, as I say, have to weigh up the pluses, the pluses and the minuses over here. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's a, just to show what what the what a person's capable of. You're at a high level, and you have all the rationalization in the world for it, and in the end, you're still. Where do we find an example of this earlier in the Torah? We had an example of this earlier in the Torah. The classic example. Where do we find this? By Yosef's brothers. Yosef's brothers convened a, a based in and they, they, they sat in judgment on Yosef and they ruled that he's liable for the death penalty. They had every argument. I guarantee you if you would have been there, if I would have been there, if we would have been there, they would have convinced us that Yosef is a villain and he deserves to die and that we'll just sell him instead. And there was one thing. What was really motivating them? Jealousy. Jealousy. At the end of the day, there was something deep down inside, some point of a bias at a very subtle level, which was, which was affecting their judgment. And that's what's happening to these spies. You talk about the leaders of the Jewish people here. You talk about the highest level people here. And at some point deep down inside, we'll see in a second, but at some point deep down inside, there's a way to, 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 to distort things. Okay? So it goes through the entire list over here. And uh, then we have the first good guy, Lemate Yehuda Kolev ben Yefuna. Kolev ben Yefuna, the word Kolev obviously doesn't sound like a very complimentary name. It's the exact same letters as Kelev, which is a dog, right? So one of the ideas here is uh, uh, one of the commentators says that Kolev, Kolev stands for the idea a dog is a brazen creature. You can find a little dog, you get a little poodle, and he'll bark at you, you know, you know he's no, no hesitation to bark at you. You, get, you know, he's just a little thing, and he's making all that noise barking at you. Kolev had the brazenness to stand up against the entire Jewish people, which we'll see. And Yefunah comes from the word he turned away. He turned away from the plot of the spies. Kolev ben Yefunah, he turned away from the plot of the Miraglim. Okay? And so the Torah goes through the whole list, and then we have the other hero, which is in Pasuk Ches, and this begs an explanation, because it says... Lemate Ephraim, the tribe of Ephraim, I'm reading eight lines to the top now, from the tribe of Ephraim, Hosea bin Nun, which we're going to find out later is really what? Yoshua. Okay. Now, watch this. Look the next line. Skip down one line. Lemate Yosef, Lemate Menashe Gadi ben Susi. For the tribe of Yosef, from the tribe of Menashe, is a man named Gadi ben Susi. Now, the question becomes, Yosef had two sons. Who were his two sons? Ephraim and Menashe. Why does the Torah, when it comes to Yoshua, 
It says, Lamate Ephraim, and it doesn't mention a word about Yosef. It says, Lamate Ephraim, Hoshea Binun. Yet when it gets to the other tribe that came from Yosef, it says, Lamate Yosef, Lamate Menashe, Gadi Ben Susi. You heard a question. Why by the tribe of Ephraim, who comes from Yosef, Yosef's name is left out. And it just mentions from the tribe of Ephraim is Hoshea Binun. And then it gets to the tribe of Menashe, it says, For the tribe of Yosef, for the tribe of Menashe, Gadi Ben Susi. Why is Yosef connected to the tribe of Menashe? Why isn't Yosef connected to the tribe of Ephraim? So, uh, 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 the Mephorshim say this actually goes and works in two directions. It's remarkable. It's remarkable how one thing could go, one thing could go in two directions here. Uh, Jake, can I trouble you to try make it colder in the room? You know how to do that? Uh, uh, Jordan, it's not as easy as it looks. This is Israel. This is, this is Israel. Uh, this is Israel. Yeah, now what, whatever you, whatever you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The, uh, the, what do you call it? Uh, uh, thank you, Isamar. The, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, the uh, 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 Rabbi Beryl Wine once said, Rabbi Beryl Wine once said, confidence, confidence is the feeling you have before you realize what the problem actually is. <laughs> you know, so it's like, yeah, I'm confident I'll work this out. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 yeah, it's the one. That's the one, yes. Yeah. He wrote a few of them. He wrote a few of them, yeah. Yeah, that was his. That was his faith. He said, "Confidence. Yeah, I'm confident I can handle. I'm confident, but I, I always feel that way when people give me directions. I got to get to a certain place. Yeah, I'm confident I'll find it. <laughs> Doesn't always work out so well. So, so the commentaries say the, over here, the Mephorshim say that it goes in two directions. On the one hand, the uh, uh, um, we find we find that that uh, from the tribe of Menashe." What did Yosef, what was Yosef's flaw? Yosef did have a flaw, and the Torah describes it quite openly. What was the flaw? What triggered off the animosity of the brothers? But what triggered, what did he do? You're right, but what did he, what, he wasn't vain. What did he do? He, he was forming against his brothers. He brought it, the Torah says, openly, he brought debusum ra. He brought back a negative report on his brothers to his father. And the Torah says the negative report. He wasn't because he was vain. He was doing it because he had, he had the best of intentions. But he did bring back a negative report. So the, 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 the spy who comes from the tribe of Menashe, who is one of the ten, who brings back a negative report, so he is associated with Yosef. Lemate Yosef, Lemate Menashe, Gadi Ben Susi. Because Yosef himself, the great great the great grandfather, Yosef brought back a negative report. And it's the one from the tribe of Manasseh that brings a negative report. So he's associated with Yosef. Whereas Hoshea Binun, who is one of the two, who brings a positive report, so that they don't make that association with it. That's what the Mephorshim said. They don't make that association. Now, take a look at Posuk Tezayit. And this is where the, commentary, the, 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 the commentaries bring a, a tremendous amount of discussion here. Eilish Shmos, six, uh, six lines from the bottom. Eilish Shmos HaNashim HaShashalach Moshe Lasur HaZoretz. These are the names of the man, that, of the men that Moshe Rabbeinu sends to spy out the land. Vayikra Moshe lehoshea binun Yoshua. Moshe renames Hoshea binun. He adds a yud on to his name, and his name becomes Yehoshua. So, the famous medrash over here is that Rashi. Rashi brings on the famous medrash. If you look at the left left side, left column, top line, left column, top line. Vayikra Moshe lehoshea. He changes his name. Nispalel Olov, he said a prayer for him. Ka Yoshiacha me'atzas miraglim. Hashem should save you from the plot of the spies. So it seems that Moshe had a, had a premonition that there is, obviously if he knew for a fact there was going to be a plot, he wouldn't have sent them. But he had a sense that it could go in two directions. Who was Yoshua? Yoshua is his prime disciple. So what does he do? He says a tefillah for his prime disciples. The commentators say, what about Kalev? Kalev was also a good guy. Why did he, why did he say a tefillah for Kalev? So one, there, there's the, the, the straight up answer and then there's a, a little bit of a more of a twist. Kalev was married to whom? Anybody know? He was married to Miriam. And Kalev was Moshe Rabbeinu's brother-in-law. So what happened last week's Parsha? Miriam gets said Lashon Hara. What happens when you get Lashon Hara? You get sent out of the camp. Yeah. If there's anybody in the Jewish people who knows 
what the fallout is for negative for Lashon Hara, it's the husband. Right? For two weeks, they're kale, for a week, they're Kalev ate tuna fish because his wife wasn't <laughs> home to cook for him. Right? So Kalev, of all people, is Moshe Rabbeinu's brother-in-law. Him he's not concerned about. Yoshua, he's got a very big concern about. Why is he concerned about Yoshua? Oh. Remember, there's two types of, you know, when Yaakov Avinu wrestled with the man. The Torah says he wrestled with Who was that man he wrestled with? Esav's angel. angel. Do you know that the Talmud asks the question, what did this angel look like to Yaakov Avinu? What did he look like? There's one opinion that he looked like a Torah scholar. He looked like a Torah. He looked like Rav Chaim Kenyavsky. He looked like a Torah scholar. That's what the one opinion. The other opinion is he looked like a bandit. At least the Mizuyan. Right? He looked like a bandit. That's what he looked like. So the question, I don't know, make up your mind. He looked like a Torah scholar, looked like a bandit. Who are we talking about? We're talking about the archangel of Esav. The archangel of Esav is the Satan, the Yetzirah, is the angel of death. He's all of them. And he looks like a Talmud scholar, or he looks like, he looks like a Talmudic scholar, or he looks like a, look at a Talmud Chacham, or he looks like a bad guy. He looks like the classic bad guy in the movies, or he looks like the classic good guy. The answer is that a person could be deceived by the Yetzirah, and this is what we were talking about earlier, about making correct judgments, you could actually be convinced that what you're doing is a mitzvah. You actually be convinced that what you're doing is a mitzvah. I know a man who goes around the world doing all sorts of good things, except that he abandoned his wife to do it. Tells his wife, I gotta go, I gotta help people in this country and in that country and the other country. What about your own wife and children? So he's convinced himself that it's a mitzvah. And instead of doing what he's supposed to do, he's doing what he wants to do. That's the bottom line. So if a person sometimes what is the right thing to, what's really the right thing to do? In a yeshiva, sometimes the guy decides to push himself a little to deprive himself of sleep so he can study more Torah. It's not a mitzvah. Then you're depriving yourself of sleep. All you're doing is going to crash. So a person has to know, where is that line? When the Yetzirah, if they put, throws out a piece of pepperoni, puts a pepperoni pizza in front of us to tempt us, the Fleischick pepperoni pizza, right? not, the, not, the par of, not the par of pepperonis that they have in the kosher shops, he puts out some tray food in front of us to tempt us. That's the Yetzirah looking like a bandit. I see what he is. When he comes looking like a Torah scholar, oh, that's a lot more subtle. That's a lot more dangerous. That's a much, much more subtle. It's a lot trickier. Remember last week there was a prophecy by Eldad and Medad? Did you guys learn that Parsha where Eldad and Medad start prophesizing? What was their prophecy? What did they say that got Yoshua upset? What was the main thing they said? Moshe is going to die and Yeshua is going to lead them into the land of Israel. That was a prophecy and Yeshua heard that prophecy and he got upset. He doesn't want the Rebbe to die. So now Yoshua has got a bias. This is how subtle this is. Yoshua has got a bias which is a mitzvah. He wants to keep the Jewish people out of the land of Israel. Why? Because if we go into the land of Israel, Moshe Rabbeinu is going to die. So he's got a motivation to keep the Jewish people out of Israel. And it's a mitzvah. His life depends on it. Pikuach nefesh, right? For, for the sake of preserving life, we violate the whole Torah, except for the three cardinal sins. So my Rebbe's life depends on it. I want to keep him out of the land of Israel. So what Yeshua Moshe Rabbeinu says, I know my Talmud over here. I know what my Talmud is thinking. My disciple is thinking that he's going to do me a favor and keep the Jewish people out. i got to daven for him. I hope you don't get caught up in the plot of the, of the, of the spies. If there's a plot coming... If there's any sort of plan to try to bring back a negative report, I don't want you to get caught up in it because you've got the biggest motivation of all. You're going to try to keep me out. You want to keep me alive. Don't, do it. Don't, don't, don't go there. Don't, do it. Don't, don't fall into that trap. And therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu says a special tefillah of, about Yoshua. Okay, now, now, now go on ahead for a second. And they go into the land of Israel. Moshe Rabbeinu says, check out the people and, 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 and what, 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 what do you call it, whatever, whatever you're going to find there. Now, when, uh, uh, the, if you take a look at Pesach 23, I don't know if we're going to be able to finish this. I'll show you something. This is, also, this is absolutely stunning. In Pesach, uh, on page 800, Pesach 23, it says, ad nachal eshkol. You see where that is? That's uh, seven lines from the top. Vayavoa nachal eshkol. A cluster of grapes. It takes two people to carry. So, 
They take a cluster of grapes, which it takes eight people to carry. And one guy picks up a pomegranate, one guy picks up a fig. And the fruit was overgrown. We'll see when they come back. Later. Tremendous big fruit. So those days, apparently, eight people carrying a cluster of grapes. Can you imagine? So you put, how do you, you got guests at your table. All right, guys, we're going to have some grape today. You take one grape and put it on the table, let everybody have a slice, like watermelon. Yeah, that's eight people carrying a cluster of grapes. You got this very big, yeah, overgrown grapes. And one guy is carrying a pomegranate, one guy is carrying a, uh, what do you call it, a, a fig. Okay, now, you know that there were seven types of fruits that the land of Israel was blessed with, seven species. Right? There's wheat, barley, wheat and barley, but there are five fruits. Wheat and barley aren't fruits, right? We brought our grains. But there are five fruits. What are the fruits? Grapes, olives. pomegranates, figs, olives, olives and dates. Why didn't they bring back olives and dates? They bring back figs, they bring back pomegranates, they bring back, what do you call it? Grapes, Grapes figs, pomegranates. What about olives What about olives and dates? Why didn't they bring back the olives and dates? The olives and grapes represent the future. Where would you have a play? It's like, okay, the grapes also represent the world to come. They, 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 not, bad, not a bad try. What about olives? Okay. They didn't bring olives and dates. Okay, the plain idea is because of they were doing this to, to, to spook the people. Why did they bring back these oversized fr fruits? They were coming back and saying, hey, we've got to land on the giants over here. You know, we're going to go in. If this is what their grapes look like, imagine what the people look like. Right? They're big grapes, big people over here. Did you ever see the movie Empire of the Ants? <laughs> no, I did. There's a movie. Don't worry, you didn't miss anything. These ants get caught in radiation. They become giant, you know, and they go eating up people. Right? So you got, you got what he caught. It was playing, it was a double feature playing with the incredible melting man. He got caught in radiation and became small. <laughs> we walked out in the middle. So the, the, the what he caught, the, it's just so much radiation you could take in one day. So, so the, the what he caught, the, 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 they bring back the olives, the dates, and the, 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 the what he called, the figs, the grapes, and the, and the pomegranates, they don't bring the olives and the dates. The plain answer is because Yeshua and Kalev weren't joining them. Each one would have taken one of them. That's the plain answer. But there's another answer, a much deeper answer. I'll give you till tomorrow. Anybody who could find this answer by tomorrow, no, I'm not going to pay you, that's for <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'll have to think about what I'll do. But, but what do you call it? You have till 24 hours to come up with an answer. All right. Okay.